what it's kind of going to be. I wanted to talk about the events that's going on in America because, man, they're pretty scary. But, you know, I, I wasn't prepared for it yet because I don't want the sermon to come out as a political issue because it's not political. All issues that we try to derive from a pulpit need to have a biblical base uh, as to why we discuss them. Of course, you will be discussing political issues that, that affect your beliefs, believe it or not. But God says you give meat in due season. And the next season coming up is the fall holy days and the Feast of Tabernacles. So as I was reviewing my thoughts to go into it, I thought a more appropriate sermon today uh, would be something that's going to focus on the fall season that's just around the corner. Because I talked to people now who said, I won't be going to the feast this year. I say, wow. And I know every year, and, and, and it's almost like it's just words that go out for people sometimes, you need to prepare right now. In other words, when you go to the feast, when you get home, the next day it's time to get ready for the next feast, if you haven't done so. So as I was thinking about that, because I remember saying last year, I said, if you don't start preparing now, by the time the feast comes, you're not going to make it. Because one thing's obvious, that the climate of the times are becoming more and more difficult. The financial picture is becoming more and more stressful to most people. And your expenses are going up. And, and I can assure you, if you haven't looked at the gas today, you go look at it next week. I have watched the oil prices rise in the last two to three weeks, almost $15 a barrel. Now, that's going to accumulate to a lot of extra money out of your pocket going to the feast for just gas alone this year. Now, the only thing that's changed... It's not the supply, but the disruption in the Middle East and the fear of what Egypt might do in the middle of all their calamity. That affects you. That affects your life and where you're going from. But the thing here is that if you're not prepared to go to the feast, and if you don't go to the feast, you need to focus on how God looks at that. All right, so I want to talk about that a little bit today. Look at, let's go to Malachi. There's a, and I'm going to work through what I'm trying to explain here because there's a parallel in God's Word that uh, it's, it's always been there, but I really didn't pick up on it in the way that I want to share with you until this morning. And so I wanted to talk about that in the book of Malachi, chapter 3. In Malachi, chapter 3, and I'm going to begin in verse 1. Usually when a minister goes to Malachi 3, what's he going to? He's after your pocketbook. You're, you're laughing. I know. I didn't look. He's like, going after my pocketbook already. He says, you know, you didn't trust me here with. And uh, see if I, uh, you know, open up your pocketbook and give it to God. Except the preachers today, they don't tell you give it to God. They say, give it to me so we can make good use of your tithes. That's not where I'm going to. I'm going to, I'm going to, in fact, I'm going to skip around that because there's something I think that's even more important here. Malachi 3, verse 1 says this, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord, and whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, says the Lord of hosts, but who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appears? For he's like the refiner's fire and a full of soap, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering of righteousness. Now, I want to begin to develop that theme in those three verses, and I'm going to break them down just a little bit. But as I was going through that, there was a story that I remember sharing. It's online. You may have heard it before. Uh, it's nothing new. In fact, I, went and I found it again. The author is unknown. But I want to read the story because it talks about what Malachi is talking about here. And then I want to put it into context of the holy days and of the feast and of the millennial reign. And put it all together for what God's talking about. Because what God's looking for here says, an offering of righteousness. 
So he's not looking at your pocketbook. God's looking at your heart and seeing what you're able to give him. Because in these scriptures, it's talking about a time. A time when Jesus Christ is coming back. A time when he's going to gather up what he's been refining. And so, let me read this little story here. It's only a page long, and then I want to go in through these scriptures. It says, there were a group of women in a Bible study on the book of Malachi. And as they were studying the chapter 3, they came across verse 3, which says, He shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. This puzzled the woman, and they wondered what the statement meant about the character and the nature of God. One of the women offered to find out about the process of the refining of the silver, and she would get back to the group at their next Bible study. That week, the woman called up a silversmith and made an appointment to watch him at work. She didn't mention anything about the reason for her interest in the silver beyond the curiosity about the process of refining silver. As she watched the silversmith, he held a piece of silver over a fire and she let it heat up, or he let it heat up. He explained that in the refining of silver, one needed to hold the silver in the middle of the fire where the flames were the hottest as to burn away the impurities. The woman thought about God holding us in such a hot spot that she thought again about the verse that he sat as a refiner and purifier of silver. So you begin to draw the connection how God takes us and he takes us into a special spot and he begins refining us and taking out our impurities so that we can be like silver. She asked the silversmith if it was true that he had to sit there in front of the fire the whole time the silver was being refined. The man answered and said yes. He not only had to sit there holding the silver, but he had to keep the eyes on the silver the entire time that it was in the fire. If the silver was left even a moment too long in the flames, it would be destroyed. The woman was silent for a moment, then she asked the silversmith, how do you know when the silver is fully refined? He smiled at her and he answered, Oh, that's easy, when I see my image in it. So did you get that? So God is refining us so that when he looks at us, he sees him. I said, wow, that's pretty. First time I come across that story, it was back in 2003, and I went back and I pulled out my notes, and I said, wow, that's pretty. And I hadn't talked about that. It's been 10 years ago since I used that, that little story. And I thought about something even more today because in light of what God's talking about here as the refiner and going through the scriptures, some questions came up in my mind. And so I'm gonna impose them to you and give you some answers and some scriptures. My goal today is to focus. To focus on what God's requiring out of us and why it's important that we keep his holy days and why it's important that as we remove the impurities from ourselves with his help that he can see our image alright so let me give you a couple of questions a couple of scriptures and then I'll go back and make a point to these three verses the first question it says that when he comes in verse 2 it says who may be able to abide the day of his coming and who shall stand when he appears? Now that's a question God's asking. Who is able to do that? Well, we know who God says. So if you want to, I'm going to read you the verse. If you want, you can flip there, keep your spot, and come back to this in Revelation chapter 20. All right, so if you're going to go to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6. But I'm going to come back to Malachi. I'm going to do this a couple times. Revelation 20, verse 6, says this. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. Now, in the verse itself, in, chapter, in verse 3, it talks about purging them, and it talks about the, those that are going to be purged would be like the sons of Levi, and the sons of Levi were who? They were the priests of God. So God's saying that if you're going to be in that first resurrection, you're going to be priests and kings. 
So who God's talking about the sons of Levi purging them like the refiner. In this day and time, he's talking about you. This is, this is who this is focused on. Those who are going to be have part in the first resurrection. All right. The second question is, the why is it you all? Well, actually, it's everybody who's been up to you all and those who are going to come till he returns. The second question is, when does the purification take place? Now, your first thought might be jumping to when, Christ, when, he's, when he returns, but not for you all. The purification takes place before he returns for you all, for everyone who's called in the first resurrection. Your purification takes place right now. In other words, when you see him, he says, I'm going to show you the scripture, we're going to be as he is. That means to get there, the refining has got to be taking place right now. Right? Let's go to that scripture. All right? when, does the, when The question is, when does the purification take place? Let's go back to verse 3 in Malachi 3. Look what it says. And he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi. And as we just saw in Revelation, it says, Blessed and holy, as he has part in the first resurrection. We shall be kings and priests. In type, you will be like the sons of Levi. In type, because you're going to be priests of God. And the sons of Levi were the priests. So, and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering of righteousness. So that means that if you and I are going to be with Christ when he returns, the refiner had to be purifying you right now so that when he comes and you're with him, when he sees you, he sees him. If you don't have that character in nature, you're not going to be there. Now we know that from another scripture. Look what it says in 1 Peter 4, verse 17. 1 Peter 4, verse 17. All right, so let's go to 1 Peter 4, verse 17. It says this. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. That means, that means us. That means the judgment for you and I are here today. It's appointed for all men to die once, then comes the judgment. However, for you and I, some are not going to die. They're going to be transformed. First Corinthians knows that, tells us that. So at the moment of twinkling an eye, those who are alive won't precede those who are dead, and we're going to be caught up with Christ. So your judgment, because God's not a respecter of person, you have to have a judgment, and judge is judging you today. Right now, every single day of your life. One of the things he's judging on is how much do we put our heart into what he tells us to do? It takes work. It takes planning. It takes effort to do that. He goes on to say this. And what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let him that suffers according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing. In other words, you have to decide right now, if you haven't. And, and I'm going through some basic scriptures here because we've got a lot of new people on the mailing list. And we got... I don't know how many people on the website that just, we have lots of people going after the website and getting information. And some of this information is, might be basic to some of the people in God's church, but it's not even understood by the world. So what I'm trying to do here is refresh our minds so that our spirit is going to be in the right frame of mind when we go to the feast. And to those who have never been to the feast, put them in focus of what it is and why. Because I think back when I was at the feast, my younger years, I didn't understand the feast. I got to tell you, I probably did everything in the world wrong. Eventually, I got it started you trying to do some of the things right. But I could tell you, you could talk to Jeff. And our goal for the feast was when we looked at, we go to get a, a worldwide brochure where they were going to be having the feast sites. You know what we would do? We would find a fight, feast site we haven't been to yet, see what was in the area. So we go to Disney World, so we go to, <laughs> to Williamsburg, we go to the Smithsonian Institute, anything we could because the sermons got in our way. Honest to goodness, I was at the feast, 
I thought I was keeping the feast, but you know what I was doing? I was on vacation. I really was. Couldn't wait for the for Sabbath to be finished, especially if you're in Branson. Uh, Lake of the Ozarks, I think they used to call it that. Lake of the Ozarks had 12,000 people at that feast site. Sometimes I think it got as high as 14,000 at one time. Well, that entire community was only opened for church people. So if you went out on Friday evening, there was nothing open. Because the vendors there, the stores and everybody, they knew nobody was coming. It was the strangest thing when we went out on a Friday night, the first time we went there, and everything is closed. And so our first thought was, wow, this whole community shut down for after, it must be after Labor Day. So after church on the Sabbath, we went out, drove around that night, everything's open. Boy, were we shocked. Well, the community knew more than I did about the Feast of Tabernacles. They knew that if you opened up on Friday night and you wanted those people to come to your game or Friday you know, game room or whatever they had going on, riding go-karts, nobody's coming. You know, we were silly enough not to know that. Anyway, so we did everything possible to think we're keeping the Feast of Tabernacles. And I'm sure God had to wink and say, boy, these bunch of goofballs down there, they just don't get it. But I'd go every single year. Gradually, as I matured a little bit, understood that, wait a minute, this is not the focus. When I finally realized fellowshipping with God's people at the feast brought a lot of joy, my mind focus began to change. If you're going to the Feast of Tabernacles and your goal is to just get something out of it, you're missing the boat. You honestly are missing the boat. I'm going to ask you to try to do something if you've not done this. This year when you go to the feast, see what you can do to give something. And I'm not talking about your pocketbook. I'm talking about what can you do to serve. When part of my life began to change is one year I was, I was just looking around for something to do. And uh, pretty much most of the responsibilities were taken care of. So down in Florida, when they, had, they used to have for the church an overflow, this was with CGI. And they always talked about the overflow tent that was out in the grass, and all the ladies and poor, poor people out there getting bit by sand fleas, no air conditioning at the feast. Some of you shaking your head, yeah, you've been there. If you got there late, everything in the air conditioning was taken up, they put you to the overflow. It's kind of interesting when you think about it, you know, because when that trump sounds, the seventh trump, if you're not there when the trump sounds, you're going to be out there with the overflow. You're not going to be up there with, meeting with Christ if you're not prepared. Well, one year, I'm looking around, and one, some, somebody asked me, he says, how come we don't have any songbooks out here? Well, they must have thought I was on duty, but, but I wasn't. I said, I don't know, let me go get a songbook for you. So I went inside, and I saw the people, and I said, we need some songbooks outside. I said, boom, there's some songbooks. I'm going to walk out there, <laughs> bringing out the songbooks. Well, they had to go set up TVs out there, and they had to set up speakers and sound and everything else. Well, I made it my point every, every day. I said, well, I'm going to go outside, and I'm going to give out songbooks. Well, you know, next thing I know, I'm ushering out there, and people's asking questions, and they're looking for this, and they're looking for that. And, man, I was so busy that feast. It was great. And I, I had a great time. And I just simply looked for something I could do. And I had a great time with it. And so, you know, the next year I went back, I went looking for my tent. So that's where I'm going to go, go work at next year. And, and you know what? I really enjoyed that. That was an offering that I was able to make, and without preparing for it, just to do something. So many people go to the feast, their health is bad, the, the job situations. Singles sometimes have to leave families home. And, you know, it's difficult. Find somebody, take them out, enjoy some fellowship time with them. There's an activity that you can help sponsor, you know, maybe uh, some group thing that you could possibly do. So the point is here, is that God says he's purging us that we may offer an offering of righteousness. Now here, here's the question, what is this scripture, you're t I'm talking about the feast, right? What is that talking about with these verses? Well, it suddenly dawned on me. When do we meet Christ in the air? Well, everybody understands that's trumpets, right? Pictures trumpets, the return of Christ. 
What is he ushering, ushering in? The millennial reign. What is pictured as the millennial reign today? Tabernacles. So what God's telling us here is that we are every year rehearsing through the holy days the time that we're going to be with him in the millennial reign. That's, well, that's simple. Nothing complicated there. That brought me to another question, though. When I meet Christ in the air, God will and I will, I have gone through the purification process. When he sees us, hopefully he sees him. And I got a scripture that says, because when he appears, we're going to be like him. That's the scripture. So now, it asks the question, this year when I go meet him, will he see him in me this year? When you go to the feast this year, when you keep the feast this year, you can't make it somewhere and you're at the house for whatever reason, will he see himself in you this year? Because that's what it's supposed to represent, right? If the Feast of Tabernacles represents the millennial reign, it's the time when we're tabernacling with Christ. Is he not supposed to see himself in us now? This is not something we can wait. In other words, we have to be going through that right now. 1 John chapter 3. Let's go to 1 John chapter 3. Look what it says. 1 John chapter 3. He says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not, because it knew him not. Verse 2. Beloved, now we are the sons of God. Not in the future. It says now. If you've been called and you've gone through the repentance and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you have been granted the gift of His Holy Spirit, you are a begotten child of God right now. That means that you carry the name of the God family, the elder brother, Jesus Christ. That means that when you move through wherever you're at, they need to see God in you right now. Not next week. Not the Feast of Tabernacles, not the time of Christ returns. Now and forever forward. Going on to says, say this, Behold now we are the sons of God, and it does not appear yet what we shall be, but we know, he's writing this with all boldness and confidence, that when he shall appear we shall be like him. Because that's what the refiner is doing. He's preparing us, he's taking all the impurities out of us. Sometimes you wonder where you're going through the difficulties in your life that you're facing. It's because God's trying to make you Him. Just like Him. So that you can be just like Him. Because it says we shall be like Him. That means this. If we're going to be like Him, that means we have to have this mind in us. It says put this mind, Jesus Christ, in you. The one that was in Him. No, so you have to think like Him. You have to work like Him. Act like Him. And it, and it takes time. It says, For we shall see him as he is. And every man has this hope in him, purifies himself. That's the hope we have to have. If you have that hope in him, you're going to him. You have, God says you purify yourself. Because that's where your focus is. See, my focus in my early years in the church, I was going to feast and have a good time. Now I go to feast and I want to have a good time. But it's different. His focus is different. Not the same way that it was. Now, let's go on. It says, uh, look what it says in verse, verse 2. But we know that when he shall appear at the sound of the trump. Now, you know, there's, there's a church that's been going around some of the churches, and there's a very, uh, I don't know how to, how to explain it, there's a, a man, a minister in the church of God, who began to talk about and preach, and some of the churches have been picking up that, that Christ is going to return at Pentecost. That's not, that's not scriptural. I, I, and I don't know why people do that. But if you understand the very basics and the foundation of Jesus Christ, I need to bring this out now because the Bible is very clear about the holy days. Pentecost represents the 7,000 year plan of time. It is the harvesting of man through the entire 7,000 years. The climax of Pentecost isn't the 
49th or the 7th, 7th, it's the 50th. And the 50th was the type back in the time when they were given the commandments. It was the type when they were given the Holy Spirit. But it points to the time of total freedom, the Jubilee, at the time when the Heavenly Father is going to be coming down to be with us. And so it doesn't make any sense to understand, well, you're going to come on Pentecost, because still at Pentecost doesn't happen until after the millennial reign for the true jubilee, the new heaven and the new earth. But you have Christ who is our Passover. When does that take place? At Passover. You're talking about the Holy Spirit given with the freedom, the truth of the Father, which is the down payment. When? On Pentecost. Because he says this is just a down payment. There's more to come. It doesn't culminate there. Trumpets, it talks about at the sound of the trump. The atoning process at the re is when Satan is put away to make the atonement in the at one meant. The plan of God centers around the, the holy days, and that's what everything pictures. And to take and say Christ is going to return any other time than what the Bible says, it's, it's to misdirect the truth. And I just wanted to explain that because a lot of people are picking that up. And you can, you can twist and can contort a lot of scriptures. But the truth of the matter is, Christ is coming at the sound of the trump. That is trumpets. That's clear from the scripture. And I, and I don't know how people twist that. But I know some of the churches have, and, and, and it slipped into to some of the churches, and some of the members have talked to me about this new teaching. Now, I ask everybody, please be careful. When these new teachings come out, most of the time they're not new. They're left turns. They're just, they're just out there somewhere. And you wonder how somebody can pick that up. But you can make a good case. You can make a good case. But they're not true. Just like years ago brought in a good case that both goats were Christ. So what? One, one is the goat, the Azazel goat that takes away the sin because he's placed all the sins back on his head. And next thing you know in the churches they say, well, both goats must be Christ which takes away the very foundation of the basic principles of God of the holy days. So I know maybe some of this is new to you, but there are people that are, begin these things to circulate the churches every now and then. And around the holy days, you begin to find they show up. And so all I ask is go fact, stay with the facts of Scripture, and, you, and you'll be sound. When shall he appear? At the sound of the trump. All right, the sound of the trump. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52. It says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Ushering in the Feast of Tabernacles, which is now known as the Millennial Reign when Christ comes. The Millennial Reign. So at the sound of the trump, Jesus Christ ushers in the millennial reign. So, so what we're doing is when we're getting ready for the Feast of Tabernacles, you're preparing to be with Christ. So when we show up on that first holy day, that first night that you meet with everyone else, everyone should be seeing Christ in you. So when you go with prayer, God should look down in your heart and see him. That spirit should be so filled inside of you with your excitement. Now Satan, <laughs> excuse me, Satan is going to do everything in his power to keep you from being there and having that image. Man, will he do that. I remember, I forgot who it was who told me this years ago. He said, if Satan can't keep you from going to the feast, he'll try to do everything in his power to keep you from enjoying it when you're there. And boy, that's the truth. I mean, my experiences, I, I think I've been through that. I mean, it's just, by the time I got there, I was so tired, so wore out, and so miserable. Cars breaking down, you travel with other people who don't like doing it the way you're doing it, or you don't like the way they're doing it. By the time you get there, you're such a bad attitude, you'd have been better off staying home. Because I've been there too. It's a learning process as you're going through. Things come up. Finances. Why did God tell people to save a second time? Now the world will hear that second time and says, man, that church wants your money, wants all your money. Now he wants a second time. That second time is yours. Doesn't belong to anybody else. And if a person doesn't save the second time, they're robbing from their families or themselves because then they don't have enough money to go to the feast. 
So there's a commercial on TV. I don't know if you'll see. I can't remember. I was for the life of me, I wanted to remember the name of the commercial this morning, but I can't remember it. But it was so relevant to what I'm thinking about here for the feast. The guy's out. He's trying to buy a barbecue pit. And there's two or three different ones, but the one that really struck home was the barbecue pit. We got this barbecue pit over here, it does everything, and it's like it's all automatic. It's got a four-speed shift, and he says it's got this sauce rack. The guy says, whoa, a sauce rack. And, so, and he goes, and he got his other one, he goes, well, how much? And he pulls his money out, and then the money, he's got like yellow money, and he's got regular money. And he's counting his money out. He don't have enough money for that one, because his yellow money is his retirement. Have you all seen that commercial yet? And so he went to go buy it, but he can't because if he does, he has to use his yellow money and he don't have his retirement. He said, no, I can't afford that. He said, I'll go ahead and get this one over here. And the guy says, yeah, but the sauce rack. And I thought it was so appropriate for the feast because, you know, God says you got a second tithe. All year long, you get your money that comes out of your pocket. And, and like, there's things that you need, things that you want, or things you could do without. How often during the course of the year, if you're not saving, do you go into your yellow money for the feast? And I thought about that, because you know when I first came into the church, one thing they drilled into us, every, year, every week you put your money aside. Now I know everybody can't afford to save a full 10%, especially if you've got family, you're on retirement, you're on fixed income, and everything else is going up on you. I can only preach what God says, and he says save 10%. From your end, do the best you can to that point, and you go to God with the rest. That's between you and God. It's not for me to beat anybody up about that. But so the point of what I'm trying to make here is do you need a sauce rack? <laughs> you know, you see what I'm talking about? Or do you have to go out and eat three times a week? Can you go out once? Can you cut back on something else? Does a person have a bad habit that you, that you say, well, if I just cut this back, you know, I, 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 maybe I can make it to the feast. In other words, all year long, you're confronted with choices. What can I do to make sure I do what God tells me to so I can make it to the feast? See, see my point there? And so what I would do, what my dad taught me, because I was like 19 years old, he says, get your separate account. If you want to, get your separate bank account. And every week when you get your check, put aside your money in that account and don't touch it. You know what? That made sense to me. In fact, he even helped instruct me on each day. If I'm, if I'm going, back then you didn't have to have a lot of money. Three or four hundred dollars, you could have a great feast. You can't get a room for that much money these days. That almost costs you gas these days going somewhere. Okay, I go down with so much money. Then he would say, okay, each day, break down how much money you got that you can spend each day. And then, you know what, I did that, and I budgeted myself, and I had a great feast every year. Didn't take a whole lot of money. When the feast got really rough, sometimes your, your car breaks down right before you go. Take some funds out, use it to fix your car. So anyway, there's things that you can do. But the point is, God is seeing how much you want to be with Him. Now a person says, well, I'm not going to go this year. I'm not going to keep the feast this year. Well, if, you, if the feast represents the millennial reign, can you miss the millennial reign? Well, I'm going to miss this millennial reign, but I'll catch it next thousand years. That sounds silly, doesn't it? But do you see where I'm coming to? All right, so that's, a, that's enough on that issue. I just want to drive the point home how important it is, because what God's telling us is we're rehearsing every year to be with him. Every year we're rehearsing to be with him. And, and he wants us every year to be more like him so that when he does come, we can be changed at the instant in the twinkling of an eye. You know, things getting away, jobs, schools, families, businesses, finances, breakdowns, cars. And as I was preparing the sermon, I thought another little story here about Anthony Baptiste. You all remember Anthony Baptiste? Anthony Baptiste was an elderly gentleman. He was single. Very quiet. He came in. He was diligent to be at services all the time. His last feast of tabernacles, he had been sick, and he had had some, some difficulties, but he said he was going to the feast. 
At the feast, he said, God willing, I'm going to be here next year. Well, it was after the feast, Anthony began missing services. When he missed the second service, or was it the third, I think it was, we got concerned. So Bobby said, after church, I'm going to go see how Mr. Baptiste is doing. Because evidently, he mustn't be feeling well, because he had no phone. When Bobby got there, he found him. He was dead. He had died a few days earlier, but he had no power in his, his house. He had no utilities. But he said he was going to be at the next feast. That man opted to go without anything in his house because he says, I'm going to the feast. And when he went back, he had no power in his house. And he says, God willing, if I'm alive next year, I'll be at the feast. I never forgot that story with that gentleman. That's how important it was to him. What was his offering? The offering to God that he gave everything he had, but he was going to be with God. He was going to tabernacle at least one week with God every year at the feast because he wanted to be with God when Christ returned. That's an incredible story for someone of an elderly gentleman who never complained about anything. But he was dying. It didn't matter. He was going to keep God's feast. All right. So let me repeat. When you show up at the feast, how will you appear this year? This is how we should appear. Look in 2 Corinthians. Now, by the way, I don't know when a person gets to hear this sermon. If you get to hear it before the feast, it applies this year. If you get this sermon and you hear it after the feast, it applies next year. <laughs> so whenever you get it, it applies. So if people say, well, that's not a timely feast. Oh, yes, it is. It's a timely sermon. So no matter when you have it, you're always prepared for next year. And who knows, maybe by next year, Christ will return. Probably not. We haven't had the three and a half years. You shake it, everybody. I wanted to say that because people say, there you go, set in time again. Like, I understand. I'm not trying to say next year, but I'm saying close. It is getting close when you look at the climate and the times of things that's going on today. All right, 2 Corinthians 3. It says, Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all... With open face, beholding in a glass the glory of God, we are changed into the same image from glory to glory. It says we're changed from glory to glory. That means in this life, we should be glorified with His Spirit in us, so that He brings us to the glorification in the Spirit. So we're changed, it says, from glory to glory. Did you catch that? That, because why? Because we're being refined. All the purifications are come. We're, we're getting rid of all the old stuff, and Jesus Christ is dwelling in us. So when God the Father looks down on us, and He's what He sees, He sees us through Jesus Christ, His Son. So when He sees us through His sons, He's seeing perfection in you. So that's when they're saying you change from glory to glory because the Father sees Christ in you. He doesn't see all the bad stuff that Jesus Christ is pulling out of you. So that when he's presenting you before the Father, it's purification, just like the silver. So we change from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. In, verse, in Colossians, and it goes on in verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1. It says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the throne of the right hand of God. Set your affections on those things that are above, not on the earth. In other words, don't do like Tom did at the feast. Go look for go-karts, game rooms, pizza parlors, bowling. Man, whatever we could find, we went and did it. And man, we would do it hard. Sometimes we wouldn't get in at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. It was time to get up to go to church. We would go. But man, we couldn't even hardly see and stay awake for services. Getting ready for the next night. You know, when you're 19, 20 years old and you're only there, you're not yet really converted, you do whatever's natural to you. And that seemed natural to us. So anyway, we was doing it. Set your affection on those things that are above. So that, verse 4, that when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, you shall also appear with him in glory. You know, even today when, when the kids have their activities, we had fun. When we took the kids out and the teens for their activities, Jeff and I was the first ones on the bungee jumping. Yeah, you laugh, but it's true. We were the first ones out there doing bungee jumps. The teens were afraid to go on that bungee jump thing. 
So Jeff and I looked at each other, come on, let's go, we show them how to do this. Next thing we know, we'd look like a rocket. You ever see a slingshot? You sit in this car, and these things must be 3,000 feet high. They're not that high, but it sure seemed like it. It's like they pull you back and they shoot you off like a slingshot. Man, you're up there, and you're hanging midair till it decides to come down. And when you come, you come quick. And you usually come in it upside down when you do that. And then finally when you come down and you flip, there you go again. First time I did it, I said, what have I got into? Man, when it was all over, next thing you know, the kids been there up there, they're going back. And we jumped and we got them out of the way. It's our turn again. So we went back, we did it again. So even when you turn spiritual, you can still have a lot of fun. But you balance it out. For all examples of what to do and not to do, you come see Tom and I'll tell you all what to do because I've done them most of the time. All right. Going on, let's go now to Ecclesiastics. Every year the Jews would read, in fact some of them still do, they read the book of Ecclesiastics. It's a, it's a book of wisdom. Because you see, let's suppose you're able to do what God says. And you've got a good job, and you save the 10%, and you make 100000 a year. All right, so, I know I'm dreaming. So what is he talking about? 100000 a year, going saving 10 All right, suppose you did that. Well, here's what God's plan is. You take 10% and you go to feast and enjoy what it says. Whatever your heart lusts after or desires is a better term. In other words, whatever you want to do. Well, you know, you got one week in a day, eight days, to spend a whole year's savings. Man, you can hurt yourself. You can really hurt. I mean, you know what I'm talking about? That much money? The point is, God wants you to go and enjoy yourself. Why? Because he wants you to appreciate the abundance of what it's going to be like with him. But that's a problem. A carnal mind will do what Tom did. <laughs> you laugh, it's true, yeah. He's a wreck. I mean, the next morning, you've got them eyes sitting up there and waiting to get up and go out again and goof off all night again. But God puts a balance into it. So what he does... Read Ecclesiastics. It's going to give you a balance in what's important in life. Well, I didn't know about Ecclesiastics. All I knew was, oh, let's go out and have a good time. We would sneak away one day during the feast. One, day we went to, one time we went to Disney World. When we was up in Virginia, we went off to Williamsburg. We couldn't see everything, so we snuck off a second day to Williamsburg. When it was over, we went up to uh, the Smithsonian Institute. We hit everything we could possibly hit. And services got in our way sometimes. You're laughing, it's true. I mean, I probably shouldn't be saying all that, but it was true, so I mean, why not? I mean, you know, I repented of all of that. In fact, last year, again. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. You. People say, well, why do you spend so much time visiting all these church sites? This is because it keeps me out of trouble. It just keeps you out of trouble. In fact, most of my feasts are sitting in an airport waiting for another plane. All right. Ecclesiastics 12, verse 13 says this. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment, and with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. All right, so whatever you're going to do, God's going to know what's going on. But now he's talking about in verse 8, same chapter, moving up the scriptures just a little bit in verse 8. Look what he says. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he, had, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. He said, yeah, he's, he did all these things, but he himself wrecked his life terribly. As you go through the scriptures, you'll see why. In fact, you will see some of the kings that came after him was tearing down the idols that he built for his wives. But even still, he went through doing what he was... In other words, he didn't always do what he said. But he says, but even through all of this, I had sound judgment in my mind to record all these things. And what was one of the things he did? He set in order many proverbs. In other words, there was proverbs that, they, that he had that he would set them out to, to put in place. Verse 10. So the preacher sought to find out what the acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even the words of truth. The words of the wise, or as, as goads, and as nails fastened by the masters of the assemblies, 
which are given from one shepherd. And further by these, my son, be admonished of the making of many books. There is no end. Much study is awareness of the flesh. In other words, he said, I did it all. I have done everything. I wrote books. I wrote all these things. But it meant nothing. That's why he went to the conclusion is to fear God. Now, let's just take a, I'm just going to give you a couple of proverbs before I bring this to a conclusion. Because my point today is simply to put us in remembrance of how important things are. But the one point I wanted to make is that when Christ comes, we're going to be like he is. We don't have the freedom to wait till the millennium to be like he is. Because you're being judged now. God wants to know where your heart lies. Your heart lies every single day when you have to make a choice to do what he says or do what you want. My early years in the feast was, I was there, but I did what I wanted, not what he said. So you can go and not make it to the kingdom. Or you can stay home and not make it to the kingdom. The Proverbs tell us how. The Ecclesiastes tells us the importance. And the Bible shows us the way. And so you have to decide for yourself. No one can prog you or push you or drag you, belittle you. It's something you have to do between you and God. Proverbs 1.1 says this. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, and to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment to equality, to give subtlety or understanding to the simple and to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase the learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. Do understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and the dark sayings. Verse 7. The fear of the eternal is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Every year, we would be instructed how to enjoy and what we should be doing at the Feast of Tabernacles. I would hear it. It would go in one ear and out the other. It did. It really did. I didn't know it. I thought I was doing what you're supposed to do. I couldn't understand the appreciation of being with God's people. Every year, we have small feast sites. It makes it even more difficult to have activities. Everyone's presence is of value. What you can give often will be far more than what you receive. And you may never know that you have given it. But if you have showing up at the Feast of Tabernacles and God's got his spirit in you, you never know who you have helped. And many times I will get a call from a person and say, Do, should you tell me who so-and-so was because of their presence? I had a great feast. It's the simplest things to be in there. It's important that everyone takes an interest in seeing what you can do at the feast this year to help out. What we're going to try to do down in Fort Walton this year is, is I can't be there except on the first and last day because I need to travel to make it to all the feast sites. We normally try to have a luncheon where the church sponsors and appreciate everyone for all their work and their contribution during the year. This year we're going to try to do it on the first night have an appreciation banquet at a buffet with the church of sponsors so everyone can come together and fellowship and try to set the tone of love, the camaraderie and joy and fellowshipping with one another where the ladies this time don't have to spend all day getting all the food set up, getting the table set up and then when it's all finished take it all back down and get all the tables and guys get it ready for church the next day where people can come together and fellowship in a wholesome wonderful atmosphere and we're going to do that on the first night and God willing, we find a place that's going to be, uh, we've got a couple ideas, we'll announce them soon. But every year, each of the feast sites do an appreciation for all those people who attend the church. So, moving on. It says, and, and let's go to Proverbs 1 verse 24. This is from the NIV. Just a couple more scriptures and I'll bring this to a conclusion. It says, because I have called and you have refused, I stretched out my hand and no man regarded it. 
But you have set at naught my counsel, and none of my reproof. I will also laugh at your calamity. Wow. Think about that. In other words, God gives us instructions. And here he's saying that there's coming a time if you don't listen to his instructions, that when you need help, he's going to laugh at your calamity. In other words, he's not going to be there. So people tell me, I can't afford to go to the feast. I say, how can you afford not to? How can you afford not to? In other words, if you work at it, somebody comes to me this year at the end of the feast and say, I don't need to be there next year, and you want to work at it? I've not had anybody who didn't go. Those who say, I can't go, don't go. A person who really wants to and puts it out for God to help them, you know what? They go. You have to want to. For someone to say, I can't make it to the kingdom, you won't. Because you're taking your eyes off of Jesus Christ. Because he tells us the work he's begun in you, he will complete it. In other words, if you want to be there, if your heart and your soul, your desire is to be with him in the kingdom, Jesus Christ says, you're going to be there with me. Now, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to make some changes, of course. But that's the way it is with anything in life. Anything in life. He says, I will laugh at your calamity and I will mock when your fear comes. When your fear comes as desolation and your destruction comes as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, they shall call upon me and, not in, and I will not answer. They shall seek me early, they shall not find me. For they that hated knowledge did not choose to fear the Lord. They were none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their own way, and they will be filled with their own devices. Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be fueled with their own devices. Wow, I read that twice, huh? Important. In other words, God's going to turn you over. Whatever you want, if that's what you want, that's what you're going to get. God says, you want to come with me and, and join me in my kingdom? He says, that's what you're going to get. And you're going to follow God and he's going to, he's going to refine you and purify you. And you know, most of the people in the church, they know that there's, there's nothing that world has to offer. And yet, even so, we don't give in to doing what God says all the time. And sometimes we need to be waking up. Another NIV in chapter 4, verse 1. It says, listen, my children, listen to a father's teaching. Pay attention, gain understanding. You, talk, so you can see a father talking to his son. Are you paying attention? Well, I thought I did lots of times, and I didn't. It says, I give you good advice. That's what God's saying. I'm giving you good advice. So don't run away from what I'm teaching you. Don't you wish you'd just grab people and say, listen, I'm telling you, listen to me. It's good advice. And I can't tell you how many people who come to me with advice and get mad at me when they're looking for advice. I mean, just flat out get mad at me. I said, well, you called me. I remember one lady, she says, every time I call you, you're always telling me the same thing. I said, well, the Bible doesn't change. What else do you want me to tell you? Curse me out and hang up. <laughs> I mean, curse me out. Call me back. <laughs> Try again. You know. So you just told me that. I said, I know it. You keep asking me the same thing. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's, it's amazing. When I read these things, I find it humorous to some degree because I see myself in these pictures so many times. It's like, man, it was just a goofball. And look, he says, I was a young boy in my father's house when my mother's, and was I my mother's only child. My father taught me, and he said, hold on to my words with all your heart and keep my commandments. Then you will live. Doesn't sound very complicated, huh? Pretty simple. I remember growing up, and I'd be, I was always in trouble. My dad would say, look, you just got to get to know God. Sure, it's easy for you to say, how do you do that? Sometimes you just got to be up, beat up a little bit. And God's going to let you walk your paths. You might have children out there that you're praying that they'll be in the church. They grew up in the church and they're out there on their own. Don't give up. 
Because, see, God's not going to give up either. And you never know that the path that God let them walk on, they will realize they had it better. You know the story of the prodigal son? One thing about the feast with kids, they should enjoy themselves at the feast. They need to go on go-karts. They need to go out parasailing. They need to enjoy the feast because, you see, they're not converted yet. So when they're out there, they need to enjoy some of the things that children enjoy. That might be your only vacation. Take some time and make them enjoy themselves. Give them pizza, hot dogs. I mean, whatever they like. If, you know, God says whatever your heart lusts after. I'm going to go beef hot dogs, of course. You know, sometimes they don't want to sit down for a nice steak and fine dinner and sit there for hours. They want to go out there where they can slam down some food and go out there and enjoy themselves. I was 19, 20 years old and I was still looking to do that. If the, if the kids can't enjoy themselves at the feast, when they get old enough, they're not going to want to go to the feast. They want to go anywhere but that because all they remember is mom and dad make me sit there in church getting fleas bit up in a tent that was too hot because we got there too late. And it was miserable. And all they ever do is talk about was church stuff. I still hear that from my kids. He says, you want to come with us? No, yeah, I'm just going to sit around and talk about church. But they, they do talk about church now. Thanks to Audrey. You know, they to get them down here just like this thing here. Teach them, teach them, teach them. I know this is a lighthearted sermon. I'm trying to make it light but important. Because I want, I want you to be able to share it with family. Share it with friends. Because you see, there's no greater time than it's coming than when Jesus Christ returns and you get to tabernacle with him. That's what he says. He's going to tabernacle with us. Why is he tabernacling? Because he's waiting for the time for his father to come. And for those thousand years, he's going to tabernacle, which means temporary abode. He's going to give you a temporary abode with him for a thousand years while he waits for the new heaven and the new earth so he can be with his father. That's what this is all about. And in the middle of it all, what are you going to be doing at the, at the Feast of Tabernacles? You're going to be working. That is the millennial reign. You have a job to do. And that's to teach and instruct, to get everybody who's in that millennial reign for a thousand years to understand the plan of God. That's why I say this year when you go to the feast, find a job and do it. Because that's what you're going to be doing for a thousand years. And find something you like to do. If, you, if you're one who talks a lot, Find somebody you can talk to. You never know. They might even like it too. Of course, you might wear them out and bore them to death. But you, know, but you understand what I'm talking about. If you're one who can fellowship with somebody or welcome somebody, you've got a great smile. Y'all remember Miss Annie when she was alive. I don't know anybody like Miss Annie. Sweetest, kindest, gentlest person. She always had a smile on her face. I remember one time I was in the hospital visiting with her and she didn't have her teeth in. And she was smiling. She forgot about that. But she kept smiling. When she realized she didn't have her teeth in, she put a hand over it. And she still smiled. And she thought that was so funny. <laughs> Miss Annie's job was to sit at that front door. When anybody came in, you know what she did? She smiled at them and welcomed them when they came in. Everybody loved Miss Annie. At the Feast of Tabernacles, they all looked for her. It was a treasure to find Miss Annie sitting there on duty, doing what? Enjoying people as they come in. What an incredible job that was. I couldn't do it. She loved to do it. She just liked to be around people and she smiled. Going on. Let's go on and I'll bring this to a conclusion. It says, hold on to my words, verse 4, and keep them in your heart. Keep my commands and you will live. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Don't forget my words. Don't turn away from them. You know what a parent talking to a kid? Didn't I tell you? You better listen to me. Ain't that guy, what the guy does to you and I from time? He says, and he says, wisdom is best, so get wisdom. No matter what it costs, get understanding. The value of wisdom and she will lift you up. Hold her close and she will honor you. She will set a beautiful crown on your head. She will give you a glorious crown. My, my son, listen. Accept what I say and you will live for many years. I'll bring it to a conclusion with that. There's other things I wanted to talk about. But I think that pretty well sums it up. Is that it's not too late to go if you want to go, if you can. If you can't make this year, make next year.
But the goal is do it because God says to. Like he says there in Proverbs, my son, listen to what I say because you can live. And if you can do that, simplest little thing, saying what I can do to make someone else's feast better, you can't I'll give God. It will be the best feast you ever had. And then when people talk about the feast as the best feast they ever had, it generally is. It's not made up. It's something they like to do, something they enjoy doing. And you get away from this world, and you put the past in God's hands, and you go and enjoy the Feast of Tabernacles. Because you see, Christ is coming back. And you get a chance this year to be like he wants you to be when he comes. Don't mess it up. Enjoy the feast.